Yeah, thank you, Joao, for the kind introduction. Um, it's great to be here today. So uh, 1971, 46 years ago, the US Congress um, declared war against cancer. Where are we today? Well, uh, there are 26 new cases globally um, per, per minute, about six since I started speaking. One in eight deaths worldwide you know, caused by cancer. In the US, it's actually one in two men and one in three women. Um, obviously, it's one of the most uh, important uh, health challenges of our time today. And it's not just a disease of the old. And as the world ages um, and it gets more developed, it's actually getting worse, not, uh, not better. And so why has progress been so slow? Um, let's take a step back and, and really kind of zoom in on the problem here. If we look at the pre-cancer setting, early detection, we all know that outcomes improve the earlier we find the disease. For active cancer patients, uh, because cancer evolves you know, so rapidly, it's hard to stay ahead of the disease, and cancer seems to evade whatever treatment we throw at it. And in the post-cancer setting, there are tens of millions of cancer survivors living in fear every single day that their cancer is going to come back, and they don't really have any test that can give them quantitative peace of mind. So what's the commonality here between these three vignettes? It's a fact that there's missing underlying molecular information across these three stages. Um, essentially, that missing molecular information is causing this <coughs> slow, iterative feedback loop we have in terms of making progress against the disease. So we're data starved in terms of the underlying state in each of these different scenarios. So how do we fill that gap? Fortunately, the solution has been developed over the last few decades. First building block of that uh, solution really started in 1958 um, with the invention of the integrated circuit and essentially the um, inexorable march towards the digital, digital age which we now enjoy, a la Moore's <coughs> Law, um, where we can now process terabytes of information with relative ease. Second building block uh, occurred in 1982 with the discovery that cancer is a disease of the genome. It's essentially mistakes in the genetic code of individual cells that largely give rise to the disease. The third building block happened in 1994. Essentially, this was a discovery by Maurice Strohn that, um, that, that, that genetic sequence or those mutated uh, DNA are not locked away inside tumors. They're actually shed by these tumors into the blood. Um, if we could actually unlock those signals from a simple blood test, which is what is known as a liquid biopsy today, um, it would be pretty powerful. Unfortunately, the tools didn't exist in 1994 to unlock those tiny signals. And then in 2001, the, the final building block was essentially the completion of the draft human genome sequence and the ensuing investment that happened over the 15 years to bring down the cost of sequencing a he human genome by nearly a million fold. Um, you know, now it's a thousand dollar genome. In a few years, it may even be a hundred dollar genome. Uh, We'll see if that happens, but uh, it's, it's pretty exciting that we have that, that tool now. And so let's fast forward to 2014. Um, the, what's depicted here in this picture is a lung biopsy. That was essentially the procedure that was used to essentially get uh, important, vital um, genetic information from cancer patients so that they could be matched with the most appropriate therapies. In the US, the average lung biopsy costs $14,000 has a 1% to 2% mortality rate and a 19% complication rate. Um, so it's pretty, pretty grim um, you know, outcomes for, for such a simple procedure, seemingly simple procedure. Later that year, um, we, were, we essentially uh, developed a blood test, or the world's first comprehensive liquid biopsy, which could enable physicians to get access to that same genetic information, but through a couple teaspoons of blood. Um, needless to say, this test really revolutionized uh, the, the cancer space. It was one of the fastest adopted tests in oncology, and now thousands of oncologists order this for their patients uh, every single uh, year, largely because of patient stories um, like Mark's um, that you're about to see. If we can cue the video, that'd be great. I just have a sense of freedom, flying through the woods, up and down hills. It's, it's a big kick for me. My name is Mark. I'm a professional photographer in Atlanta, Georgia. I've got three daughters, very happily married. I'm an avid cyclist. 
and I've got stage four lung cancer. My scan indicated a 5.1 centimeter in length tumor and metastasis throughout my chest cavity and a cancerous lymph node on my liver. Once it started to sink in, I just knew that it was, it was gonna be a tough fight. And I was, so I'm prepared. Genetic mutations are what treating lung cancer is all about with successful outcomes. I was told that there was nothing there that's targetable. That was probably the biggest blow. Blood biopsies or liquid biopsies as they call them are kind of on the horizon. I said, I'll be happy to give up two vials of blood if we might be able to find something. And sure enough, we got the good news that the Garden 360 test had revealed an EGFR mutation. I about dropped the telephone. I'm enjoying dramatic results. With this cutting edge testing, we can cut out a lot of the guesswork and match mutations to known effective therapy. I had a lot of things in my life to look forward to, one being my daughter's wedding, and I'll have a high school graduation coming up for my youngest daughter. I've got all the tools that I need to fight this, and I am grateful every day. So um, yeah, and, and Mark is uh, you know still doing well. We ran another test on him. Um, his cancer was coming back, and he was uh, matched with another therapy that uh, is now uh, putting it at bay for the time being. And so um, it's really exciting to see in just three short years, going from essentially f driving blind, flying blind, to be able to proactively and adaptively manage the disease in, uh, in late stage patients. So where are we going? It's 2017 now. Um, we've processed nearly 40,000 patient samples, and it turns out because we have a machine learning back engine in terms of you know, how we process the data, our test actually gets better with every sample we run, with every patient we help, um, the, the performance improves. And so now that uh, when we hit 25,000 uh, patients, we actually saw a 10x imp uh, improvement in terms of performance. And now we're at the point where we're projecting in uh, the next 18 months, we'll get to um, even uh, another uh, maybe order of magnitude improvement in terms of where um, the technology will be. And what that will enable is not just use of this technology in active cancer patients where the signals are larger, but using it for the other two settings I mentioned, for cancer survivors, as well as essentially for every single one of us for early detection. So let's... Um, Let's uh, focus on early detection a little bit. Um, so, you know, we launched a major program in May of 2016 we call Project Lunar. Essentially, because of the economies of scale we've built with the technology, um, we're essentially now able to develop um, a test using the same platform that would be um, a low-cost test, be priced under $1,000 um, uh, for, for early detection and recurrence detection, initially focusing on five cancer types, lung, ovarian, breast, um, colorectal and pancreatic cancers. And we're fortunate to have partnered with uh, over a dozen um, medical centers across the world, um, some of them listed here. Um, and you know, early detection is not a new challenge. People have been trying to solve early detection of cancer for, for many years. And so um, what's the challenge there? The challenge is one of specificity. Um, that's really been the Achilles heel of tests that have been developed um, for that indication. Um, when you look at, in the U.S., uh, high-risk screening for lung cancer um, is now done uh, largely by low-dose CT scans. Low-dose CT scans, even in that high-risk population, have a 96% false positive rate. That is, 96% of the time, they see a nodule that is benign, is, is, is not cancer. Um, mammography has over a 90% false positive rate. And so specificity is, is really the, the problem. It's, Almost like you know, we're, trying to, we're trying to detect something that we don't understand. We don't even know what it truly is. Just to put this in a, you know, an analogy that may make more sense or may resonate more, this is as if you know, physicians were trying to fight infections without knowing what the associated virus you know, is or, or, or were, was. And you know, that's just crazy to, to think that 
we haven't really defined cancer. Cancer is really an agglomeration of tens of thousands of different you know, diseases. And you know, to fast forward to 2017, how do we solve that specificity issue here? And so we've been quietly amassing the world's largest um, blood-based genomic database in cancer. We now have almost 40,000 um, genomic profiles of uh, cancer patients across 40 different cancer types. And what we're doing with that data is we're applying sophisticated machine learning algorithms to this to essentially reclassify the disease, redefine the disease in unprecedented resolution down to uh, very, uh, what we call microclasses of um, subtypes of, of cancer. And what we find is as we um, accrue more data that our specificity improves dramatically. Uh, and we project when we get to you know, 100,000, couple hundred thousand samples, will be at a specificity that is sufficient for um, really a breakthrough blood test for early detection. And so in this way, every Garden360 active cancer patient we help in turn helps bring us one step closer to a breakthrough test for early detection, and at the same time helps bring us closer to uh, conquering cancer with data across all stages of the disease. Thank you.